27, and we're going to read down to the end of the chapter, Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 to 30. The message tonight is a church living the gospel. The church body living the gospel together. That's what he's talking about, I believe, in this passage. Philippians 1, verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast to one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. And let's read verse 29 and 30 together. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which he saw in me and now here to be in me. Okay, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you that you have given to us a great deposit. You have entrusted us as your people with your precious word that you have even put above your name. You said you have magnified your word above even your name and we know even in this book of philippians we read how at the name of jesus every knee will bow and we thank you that your word tells to us the gospel of jesus christ and we want to thank you for the gospel tonight no human mind could invent the gospel thank you father that you have planned it thank you jesus that you accomplished it and thank you holy spirit that you apply the gospel to our sinful and often stubborn hearts. And Lord, we pray that we individually will live out the gospel and that we corporately as well will live the gospel in a consistent way, a manner worthy of the gospel. And that is our prayer this evening, Lord, that you will so impress the gospel into our soul, into the every aspect of our being, that power will infuse every part of our lives and our thoughts, our motives, our dreams, our goals, our affections, Lord, that we would be lovers and livers of the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So here he says, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. In other places, Paul would interpret or, or Paul uses this expression and it's interpreted in our Bibles where it says, becometh the gospel a life worthy of the gospel. In other words, let your conversation be as it as is worthy of the gospel. That's becoming to the gospel. That adorns the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we're to live a life consistent with the gospel. So what is the gospel? The gospel means what? Good news. And the gospel is, 1 Corinthians 15, that Christ died for sins according to the scripture. And he was buried. And he rose again the third day, according to the scripture, and that he was seen of many people. So the gospel is rooted in history, and it's rooted in the word of God. We need to live out a life consistent with this gospel. So what is the gospel? The gospel shows the holiness of God. We need to live holy lives. The gospel, Jesus said before he went to the cross, he said, Father, glorify thy, thy name, glorify thy son, that thy son will also glorify thee. And he was going to the cross. And I believe that the gospel of Jesus Christ, what Jesus Christ did on the cross in dying and burying and rising again, shows forth the glory of God. So when we're saying live a life becoming worthy of the gospel, live a life to the Glory of God that other people see Christ, his love, his forgiveness, his holiness, his peace, his salvation. Think of all that happened on the, on the cross. So we're to live a life consistent with all that Jesus did for us on the cross. We're not to tarnish the triumphant message of the gospel. We're not to stain the message with the gospel with our sins. 
and individually our lives should be consistent with the gospel. But as I read this passage, what's amazing to me is Paul is telling the church corporately as a body to live together. Not individually, we're to individually live the gospel. But corporately, as a church body, he's writing to the church of, of Philippi, is live together. You see, because we're not lone rangers. God has called us to live for him in this world as salt and light, but also to function in a body of believers called the church, the church of Jesus Christ, his body. So tonight, may we be a church living the gospel. That must be our goal. So look, look at this passage just for a moment. And when he talks about living the gospel, I've, one of the emphasis of this passage, just by way of introduction, is is how we have to be unified in this. If we're going to live the gospel, we have to do it together in unity. And, you know, one thing the gospel shows is the unity of the Godhead. The Father sent the Son to do what? To die. And when Jesus died on the cross, he was being what? Obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He wasn't doing what he, he even said at one, when he prayed, Lord, if it's possible, take this cup from me. But he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So the son was in perfect unity with the father and the spirit was in Christ. And it was the unity of the Godhead as Jesus died on the cross. And so we must be unified. Look at this. He says that you stand fast in one spirit. So we have to have a spiritual unity. That's in verse 27, verse 27. And then also verse 27, he says, with what? With one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So again, it's he's striving together. So he says that, that ye, that's, that's plural now, that's plural, that you all stand fast. So he's talking to the church to live in a way worthy of the gospel and that together you have a spiritual unity. One spirit, uh, uh, an, an intellectual or a, a mindset unity, a unity of the mind. And if you look down, and there's really a connection between the end of chapter 1 and chapter 2. But if you go down into chapter 2, look at verse 2 of chapter 2. He says, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the what? The same love. Being of one accord of one mind. So the way I see this, one spirit... That's spiritual unity. One mind, that's a intellectual unity. And then he says the same love. That's an emotional unity. Now, when we think about this, that doesn't mean we're going to agree on every single point together. In fact, there's going to be a, a range of different views that we're going to have on certain other issues. And not all Christians agree on, on secondary or third type issues. And that's one thing when we come together in a church. Just understand, not everybody's like you. Not everybody's going to see everything the same way you see it. But I, what I'm, I believe Paul's saying here, in spite of your differences, be one in this. Live the gospel. We have to agree on that for sure. We have to have a genuine lifestyle consistent with the person and work of Jesus Christ. You know, the gospel in a way is, I mean, if you had one chance to tell somebody something, what would you tell them? If you had one chance to tell them something about Jesus, what would you tell them? You'd give them the gospel, that he died on the cross, he was buried, and he rose again. That's like the headline news. Of our faith, the gospel of Jesus Christ. He took the sins of the world on himself. I mean, I mean, it's kind of like we've heard it so much we can take it for granted, but don't take it for granted. Think of what think of the uniqueness of this message. Think of how the world is even often offended with this. That Jesus Christ went through all that suffering with the sins of the world upon himself. What, what a mighty champion, what infinite power and strength that took to take the sins, all your sins, all my sins, all our sins of everyone who's ever lived on himself to die the death that we all deserve to bear hell for us all. It's amazing. 
And then he rose again. This is like the ever breaking news. You ever watch the news? It's like breaking news, you know? Well, the ever breaking news is the gospel. And then, you know, you ever watch the news channels and underneath the news channels, they have the current. They call that the current, you know, like breaking news. And sometimes you're watching the news, but then you really read it. Does ever happen? <laughs> like you're reading, oh, did you see what happened? You're reading the thing underneath. Well, that's the gospel. Ever breaking. And it's the Chiron. It's, the, it's that Christ died on the cross. So there's three simple things here in this passage. What I believe as a church living the gospel. And I'll give you point one, two, and three. It's serve as a citizen. To live the gospel, we have to serve him as a citizen of his kingdom. Number two, we stand for him as a soldier in his army. We stand as a soldier in his <laughs> army. And the third is we strive as an athlete on his team in a sense. So we serve as a citizen. We stand as a soldier. We strive as an athlete. So look at these for just a moment. What I'm saying here, he says in verse 27, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That word conversation, if you look at the original language word, we get our word politic or political from that word. So Paul, in, in, in writing to the Philippians, says only let your conversation, and that's an old English word, but it means your whole manner of life, and it's how you govern yourself as a citizen. I mean, this is significant that he writes to the Philippians about this, and he does it not once but twice. If you look at chapter 3 and verse number 18, or I'm sorry, verse 20 of Philippians 3, verse 20, he says, for our conversation is in heaven. And I, I read that almost like your citizenship is what he's talking about. So he says, when he says, let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, he's talking about our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizen, our ultimate citizenship is not earthly. Maybe you're a dual citizen of one country and here, or maybe you're just a citizen of the United States. And boy, this is like in the news all the time. We don't want to get into that, but some people will love citizenship in the United States. And they will do desperate things to become a citizen here. But I have a better citizenship for you. A far better kingdom to be a citizen of is the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And all men could be citizens of his eternal kingdom. So he says, only let your conversation, your citizenship, let your citizenship reflect the gospel. Now, how, does, how do we do that? Oh, by, by the way, I think that he says this significantly to the Philippian church is because Philippi was a Roman colony. <coughs> and they were privileged as a Roman colony of being born citizens of Rome. And remember, Rome had a vast number of slaves. So to be a citizen gave you a tremendous head start in life so they were proud of being a rome in miniature and so paul is reminding them that your main citizenship is not to the roman government it is to jesus christ and his kingdom and our ultimate identity is not even wherever we were born and whatever language we speak although there is a normal natural sense of human connection and gratefulness for where we were born, or even national pride, if I could use that word in a good sense. It's normal to us to have a, a, a natural sense of connection and gratefulness for our forefathers, and, we, and, and to, have a, to be identified with that. But that's not our main identity once we're saved. Because now, when we're saved, we're citizens of an eternal kingdom, not just something down here on earth for a few years. Does that make sense? So our ultimate identity is now in Christ. Now, what does a good citizen do? A good citizen of any country, what is he going to do? What kind of citizen should we? A citizen has to do what? Obey. Obey the laws of the land. So what goes in the blank there is... We have to serve as a citizen in obedience. That's the blank, the bullet point under, under one. We serve as a citizen in obedience. Now, many people 
And I've heard, you know, they, there's, you know, sometimes protests and they say, if there has to be justice, you know, if there's no justice, there's no peace. That's not a biblical way to look at this world. In fact, in this life, there will not be justice. And here's the gospel life. And this is what makes gospel living so different is that here's gospel living. You don't give me justice. I'll still have peace. You don't give me justice in this world, and I will just roll it all off on my heavenly father and trust him in obedience. I don't have justice, I'll still obey. That's the, that's the, gospel, that's the gospel we live out. So Jesus was dying on the cross. Did he get justice? That was the greatest human injustice one could ever imagine. The perfect man, sinless who was absolutely the righteous Jew, crucified by the Jewish people and the whole world. He didn't get justice, but he had peace. He's the Prince of Peace. That's the gospel we're supposed to live out. So even when things don't go our way and when it doesn't seem right and mm -hmm. things seem unjust and we, we, we can seek to, I'm not saying we shouldn't seek to change those things through the political or legal structures. We can change them and, and we should as the best as we can. But I'm saying still we have to accept it from the Lord and still live in obedience. How many New Testament commands do you think there are that we're to obey? How many, in other words, how many imperatives, like even for uh, in our text here, it says only let your conversation be as if it cometh the gospel of Christ. So that's an imperative. That's a command. So that is a command. In, that's a New Testament command. How many New Testament commands do you think there are? <laughs> this is good because, you know, I'm not under, when I, the way I understand this is I'm not under the Mosaic law. I've been freed from that law of sin and death, and now we live under a higher law, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from that law of sin and death. But that doesn't mean we're lawless. <laughs> we might not be living under the Ten Commandments, but we have about a thousand New Testament commands, more than a thousand. Some say between probably about 1,200, between a 1, thousand, 1,200 imperative commands in the New Testament. So you can Google that, by the way. How many commands are there in the new testament there's lists there's good pdf lists very good study so a good citizen must be obedient and that's exactly what jesus was he was philippians chapter 2 what does it say who can read philippians 2 verse 8 for us who get that verse for us and read that for us oh bill philippians 2 8 and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He didn't, he didn't feel like it. He said, not my will, but thine be done. So obedience isn't feeling-based. It's conviction-based, a conviction to obey. So that's living the gospel. We're to serve in obedience as citizens to our great king and in his kingdom the second thing is we're to stand fast as a soldier so i get that from again verse 27 and paul he also says now whether i come and see you or else i'm absent and what i'm going to hear about what what's going on there i want to hear good things <laughs> i want to hear about how you're unified in living the gospel don't be a, we're, we're not to be a church people that are men pleasers and just Working when the boss is watching us, right? You, you, you don't work that way. Oh, no, the boss is. How many of you, though, if you're driving along the highway, you're going a little fast, and then you see a police officer behind you, and you slow down, you get, because you're like, oh, the eyes of the police. Well, how many of you have done that? You need, oh, yeah, well, let, okay, so we've all done it. I've done it too. I confess. I confess. Okay. But we're not to live for Jesus that way. His eyes are always on us. Stand fast is the second thing here as a soldier because then he says that you stand fast in one spirit and i think of a soldier on a battlefield and what does a soldier on a battlefield mean when the arrows are flying when the when the darts are coming your way the fiery darts of satan are being cast upon you when the bullets and and bombs are going off all around you a soldier on the battlefield needs courage so that's the bullet point under that. Stand as a soldier with courage. 
And Paul often uses this metaphor of fight a good fight of faith, that we're soldiers of Jesus Christ. And, and we see this in our, in our, throughout our Bible and throughout, especially in our New Testament and in the epistles, that as soldiers of Jesus Christ, we're in a well-defined army. And the enemy is also well-defined. Who's the enemy? It says Satan is our adversary. And our armor is defined in Ephesians chapter 6, in that great passage. Put on the whole armor of God. And as you put on that armor of God, Paul even says, who can get Ephesians 6.13? Who can read, get Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13 for us? Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. So withstand and stand. And so the point is, if we're going to live a life as a church body worthy of the gospel, we have to stand together in the battle for the gospel. That means we don't fight each other. We're not to be fighting one another. A lot of churches, I'm telling you, it is easy to get turned inward, get our eyeballs off a lost world, and start fighting about the color of the chairs or what we're going to do on just material things. And, and we forget there's a world dying without Jesus Christ. In real life battle, it always breaks my heart when I read about like military activity. And I think there was even a football player. He, he was a good football player for the St. Louis Cardinals back a few years ago. This is when the Afghanistan war was just warming up and the Iraq war there's a lot of patriotism after 9-11 and all that. And um, but he went into battle and he, he joined the Marines and but he he died. He was killed in a conflict, and they they found out that he was killed through friendly fire. That's heartbreaking to think about that, you know, because sometimes in battle it, it, it gets so confusing and there's so much chaos and you don't know where the bullets are coming from. And sometimes an American can kill another American. That's, that's tragic to me. I mean, as tragic as war is, that like amplifies the tragedy and the sadness of it, right? Mm -hmm. And that's how this uh, football, football player, he gave up like a million, you know, million dollars of salary and to go in patriotic, duty to fight in, as a soldier, and then he was killed by friendly fire. And you know what? A lot of Christians have been really destroyed by friendly fire. Amen. We need to be careful of our own mouths, careful of our words, careful of our actions, because I know I've hurt people, and I try not to. I try to make it right if I have hurt anyone. But sometimes people can get really hurt in church, and many people leave churches because they've been so beat down by other Christians. We're like, you know, the proverbial fish in the tank. If there's a weak fish in the tank, the other fish will go after it, you know. And sometimes we go after our own. Not Paul even tells the Galatians, don't bite and devour one another. You know, we need to stand because we're on the same side. We're in the same army. And our army is well defined. And so is our enemy and our adversary. The third thing is... We need to strive as an athlete. So look at the text here where he says that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind. And what does it then say? Striving together for the faith of the gospel. If you look at the original language word, it's amazing to me how many English words we get from the Greek language. That was that, and that actually attracts me a lot to the Greek language. I love the Greek language. It's such a beautiful language. And we, you, we get so many words from it. So what word do we get in our English vocabulary from striving together? Athlete. That's the word. Being an athlete. We're athletes on the same team. It's literally what Paul is saying. Striving together. So the, an athlete strives. An athlete is striving to win the game. And, and an athlete must work with his teammates. You know, a team sport... An individual has to do his job, but he has to do it in the context of the other players on the team. It's often been said, you know, and coaches, when they motivate players, they'll say there's no letter I in the word 
Team. Team. <laughs> That's true. In other words, you know, when you're, he says, striving together. Again, he's talking about the local church striving as a team to live out the gospel. That's, that's what I believe Paul is really saying here. And in order to do that, okay, think if you're on a football team and you're the lineman. Your job as a lineman, an offensive lineman, is to block the defensive lineman so he doesn't cream who? The quarterback. The quarterback. Mm -hmm. You know why the coach, by the way, uh, went to the bank? The football coach, he had to go to the bank? He had to get his quarterback. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. That, that was not a part of the sermon. That, that just came to me. That's like the only joke I know, by the way. So it's like, when have I ever told a joke like that? Okay. So anyway, so the offensive lineman, his what's his job? To go to block the defensive lineman so he doesn't kill the quarterback, right? Now, what's the wide receiver's job? Get open. To go out on the pass play? Get open. Now, what if the lineman is, I'm going to block this mean, nasty defensive tackle. I mean, this 350-pound defensive tackle, that offensive lineman, he's got weak knees, but he's giving it his all, man. He's putting himself out there, and he blocks the defensive tackle. The quarterback goes out. Nobody touches the quarterback. Quarterback throws a beautiful pass to the wide receiver, and the wide receiver drops the ball. What's the lineman saying? Mm -hmm. I quit, man. You didn't do your job. You know, does he cry? Does he complain? No, he has to do his job. What about a basketball player? I know some of you guys don't like football. You like basketball. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about basketball. Now, basketball, every basketball player doesn't just play offense. He has to play defense. Some basketball players like offense, but they don't like defense. And so some some players can maybe grab that guy doesn't play defense. So what if you're, you're you're playing in the game and you're guarding your player, and then he's he's trying to maneuver, get a shot, but you you block his way and he can't get past you. He he throws it to the other player, and that weak defensive player he drives right around, jams the ball. It's like man, I put myself out there, guarded my my my, my teammate didn't do it. Do you gripe? Do you complain? Is that how you win the game? Is that how you win the game? By griping and complaining against your teammates? No way. You don't win that way. How about if you're a basketball player and you make a beautiful bounce pass? And you make that beautiful bounce pass, it goes right through the legs of the defensive player. Like you just shake the man. You, you bounce with that pass right through his legs. And the player goes up for a layup and he missed the layup. Man, he, he, he blew my assist. I could have had assist on the stat sheet. And he, he blew it. Now I don't get an assist. Does he gripe? Does he complain that the guy missed the shot? What kind of team would that be? If everybody is griping, murmuring, complaining when somebody else dropped the ball, didn't guard the guy right, didn't make the basket. So what does an athlete have to do? And here, here's what the blank is. He has to keep focus. On what? He has to keep a focus on his job. What is your job? Don't worry. Ultimately, you can't control what other people do. You can control what you do. You can control what you think. You can control what you say. You can control where you go. You can control the ministries you, you do. And focus on what God wants you to do. You know what I've seen a lot of sometimes discouragement in church? And I, I thought this too is let's say you have we have a ministry and you you get just excited about doing this ministry you think this is a great ministry let's just take the homeless ministry for example uh, we, which we do once a month and we prepare sandwiches and go out and let's say man this is a great it's a great ministry you know we're giving the gospel to people in, in need in the community we're giving them sandwiches it's such a needy community but then you look around and say how come more people aren't here why, that's not right. So-and-so should be here. Where's so-and-so? How come so-and-so isn't here? Why, why aren't they here? Don't worry about who's not there. Are you supposed to be there? Then do, the, do keep your focus. 
Keep your focus on what you're supposed to be doing. Maybe that maybe that person is preparing their, their, their Sunday school lesson. Maybe they have to prepare their adult Bible fellowship lesson. Maybe they have to go out and buy food for the supper the next day. I don't know. Maybe they just need to rest after a long day of work. You know, not everybody is going to do everything. I remember when, when I first started the ministry, we, we were renting a storefront in Brooklyn. And so we, uh, we were sharing the building with Seventh-day Adventists. We were like renting the second floor of the Adventists, renting the first floor. But we got to use the whole building on Sunday since they weren't there. You know, they have their service on Saturday. So we had to clean it up after we used it. So we would mop the floor and everything. So I, I announced one saying, we're going we're gonna to come on Monday morning. We're going to mop the floor and clean it up for, so, that, and, so that we can get, make sure the Adventists are happy with how we're using their space here. So the first few weeks I did that, some people came. You know, and then after like about the third or fourth week, mm -hmm. guess what? Guess who was mopping the floor? <laughs> guess who was doing it all by himself? And I'm thinking, where so and so? Why aren't they here? I was like griping. I was murmuring. I was like so grump. I was so grumpy about mopping that floor all by myself. This isn't right. I shouldn't have to be doing this all by myself. And then God just smoked me. He says, "What are you doing this for? If you're doing it for me, shut up <laughs> and just be thankful you can mop the floor for me." Yes, yes, sir. Thank you, Lord. You know. We need to keep focus. Who can read Luke 9, 51? And then we'll just finish this up real quick, real quick. We've got to finish. Luke 9, 51. Who can read that verse? Jesus had focus on the cross is the point. Yeah, yeah. Ian, please. It came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. Instead, that he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Okay, he steadfastly. <laughs> set his face to go to Jerusalem. What was, he, what was he going to do then? He was going to the cross. So he had a focus on the cross. So what we need to do is keep our focus on the cross. So let's finish this up. Go back to Philippians. We'll just read these last few verses, make a few applications. So number one, as obedient citizens, I believe verse 28, he challenges us. Don't be intimidated. Don't be terrified, he says. Remember, you are citizens of the most powerful kingdom in the world. There's no kingdom that will, will is more powerful and will last longer than the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So don't be terrified by what they do to you. They were throwing Paul in prison, and maybe Philippians thought they were going to be thrown in prison too. They were a Roman colony. So there's nothing terrified by your adversaries, which to them is an evident token of perdition. So when they see your confidence, they'll know that they are they're, they're facing their own day of judgment. But to you, it's, it's, you will show that you're living out your salvation. But to you of salvation and that of God. So as obedient citizens, do not be intimidated. Number The second application is, as courageous soldiers, continue in the faith. Verse 29, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. So believe on him as his soldier. Continue in the faith. We don't fight for a small cause or secondary causes, but an eternal, ultimate cause, the cause of the gospel, Jesus Christ. By the way, look at the end of verse 27. He says, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Now, how do you read that? Striving together for the faith. You know how I read that? I, say, I believe he's saying here that we need to strive that is, we need to keep serving as citizens, standing as soldiers, striving as an athlete with a faith in the gospel. That you strive for the faith of the gospel. But it's also striving in faith for the promotion of the gospel, for the defense of the gospel, for the continuance of the gospel, for the victory of the gospel in people's lives. Strive with a faith in the gospel so others will hear and believe the gospel. Strive together for the faith of the gospel as a courageous soldier, continuing the faith. And the last thing is, as a focused athlete, and notice how he ends here. He says, we su we, we, but also to suffer for his sake because of the gospel. The gospel is suffering, the sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice. So we're called to a gospel way of life. That could be some form of sacrifice and suffering. It must be, actually, some level of sacrifice involved. 
But then he says, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me, that you will have conflict. That's the word fight. And one of my favorite words is in the original language is agonize. We get our word agonize from that word right there. Having the same agony. You can read that. Having the same agony. Agonize for the victory. So that's the, if you're taking notes, as focused athletes, we agonize to victory. You know, when you're in an athletic contest, you're in the fourth quarter of a football game, man. You've been grinding it out. You've been running. You've been pushing. You're getting beat up. You're getting you're you're all full of mud. You're you're just dirty. You're you're just full of sweat. You've lost your energy, but you got to get out there. The game is tied, or you're down by a little bit. You got to agonize. You got to fight, and you can't do it alone. You have to do it with other teammates. And you know, one of the greatest sporting events that I saw was when the Giants were down to the undefeated New England Patriots and they had one last chance to go down the field for a drive and Eli Manning went back for a pass and man they were chasing him they 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 grabbed him they had him down but he somehow spun away and he just like he spun away and he went over here and he just like he didn't even know who he was throwing it to, I don't think. He just threw that ball up. And this guy named David Tyree, a Christian, David Tyree, grabbed that. Remember how he caught that ball? How did he catch it? On his helmet, like with one hand, and he caught it on his helmet. And they were trying to, like, hit it out and grab the ball, but he had the ball like that. And that play, the blockers did their best blocking, and the wide receivers went out to the best of their ability to catch. And... Eli Manning did his best to keep up and stand. Everybody focused on their job, and the Giants beat. And one of the biggest upsets in Super Bowl history, the Giants beat the uh, – that was the year the Patriots were undefeated, right? And the Giants were like average that year, and they beat the New England Patriots. And any time Tom Brady loses, it's a very good day for me. <laughs> <laughs> so – and I'm not a Giants fan, but I was so happy that Tom Brady lost. <laughs> so, it is not great talent that God blesses so much as likeness to Jesus. Be like Jesus, live out the gospel. Robert Murray McShane said, a holy minister is an awful weapon in the hand of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord for your powerful admonition to the church to live together, striving together as a corporate body for the faith of the gospel. Lord, help us to hold faith and a good conscience. And Lord, help us to preach the faith of Jesus Christ. And may you save, save souls through our ministry, through our life, through our testimony. May you be glorified as we seek to live out the gospel as obedient citizens, as courageous soldiers, and as focused athletes.